in. You may be seated now, y'all. Good morning. Welcome to Liberty United Methodist Church. I'm Steve Klaus, the lead pastor. I'm so very pleased to welcome all of you here at Liberty United Methodist Church. We are a multi-campus church that exists to be a Christian community where people encounter Jesus and where lives are changed. Now, um, we have a special announcement this morning uh, because this is Palm Sunday. How many of you have a palm? Would you wave them high? Awesome. For all of our children and for those young at heart who do not have problems walking and waving at the same time, this is the time when we'd like to invite you to join Pastor Arden in our uh, lobby, and we're going to line up our young people, and we're going to have them process in in just a moment and wave their palm branches just the way they did when Jesus made his way into Jerusalem. So kids and the young at heart, again, those who are coordinated, you make your way to the lobby, and we will begin doing that. I'd like to share a few prayer requests with you today. Uh, I'd like to ask you to pray for these folks. We're praying for Luke Young, who is the nephew of Mark and Carol and Mackin, who attend our Sunset Campus. Both of his parents, he's a young man, and both of his parents were killed in an automobile accident on March 22nd, and it's just been a huge impact in his life, so please keep them in your prayers. We're praying for the Davidson family and the um, Roberts family, Bonnie Roberts passed away a few weeks ago. Her, sat, her funeral was Saturday, and uh, Mary Jo Davidson had her funeral this last week at Pleasant Valley Baptist. She is, the, um, she is the wife of Jack and Ron Davidson's brother, and so we're praying for those families. We're also praying for Betty Miller, who's been in and out of the hospital this week, for Chloe Hubbard, who is a friend of Carol Conruff, and uh, she's uh, been undergoing treatment for a brain tumor, and we're praying for Brant Peterson, who's here with us today. Brant's having some testing done to find out uh, why some of the symptoms he's experiencing are, are happening in his life, so please keep Brant in your prayers. I want to ask you and invite you, and just take a deep breath with me, if you would, please, and let it out. And let's practice and enjoy the presence of our God as we pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the ways that you are moving and the things that you're doing in the life of our church. We thank you for what we have to celebrate this day, your entrance into Jerusalem so long ago, being celebrated as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, even for a moment before the events of Holy Week happened. And Lord, we pause in the midst of our celebration to lift up our concerns. We pray for Luke Young, for the family of Duane and Jack and Ron Davidson, for the Roberts family, all of those who've lost loved ones. We pray that you will uh, use the members of our church, our pastors, our staff, all of the folks who are engaged in ministering to them, our lay leaders. I pray that you'd help them as they go through a difficult time of grief and loss. Uh, we pray for Chloe Hubbard, for Betty Miller, and for Brandt. I pray that you do a healing work in their life at this time, that you would bring answers from doctors and medical technicians, and that treatment plans would be made so that they can be restored to full and complete wellness. God, we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, who taught us all to pray this way, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So if you don't mind, if you would all just um, stand while we get ready to worship, if you're able to, and we'll start our Palm Sunday procession. Shakes. 
palms and if you would like to you may be seated now morning, my friends. Hello, hello. How is it going? Good. Excellent news. My friends, do we know what holiday we are celebrating in the church today? Easter. Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. That's right. Palm Sunday is one week before Easter, so we're really close to Easter. And on this day, we remember the day when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem and people were so excited to see him that they took off their coats and they laid them on the ground for him like it was like a red carpet. They pulled palm branches off the trees so they could wave and say, hi, Jesus, and then lay those on the ground too. They were just so excited to see Jesus. And you know, the thing I always try to think about on Palm Sunday is how we should all be just that excited to spend time with Jesus ourselves, right? We should be that excited to get to come to church and worship Jesus, that excited to pray and spend time with Jesus, to read the Bible and learn more about Jesus. And so it should be like a party, like a celebration every time we get to spend time with Jesus. So let's pray, and we'll ask God to help us remember that, not just on Palm Sunday, but every day of the year, okay? Let's, dear God, thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus, who people greeted like a king on Palm Sunday. Help us to feel that excited to spend time with Jesus ourselves each and every day. In your name we pray, amen. All right, let's stay with you and with your parents. You can come with us to Children's Church.
Thank you, Pastor Arden. <clears throat> Thank you to all of our kids and uh, our parents for sharing your kids with us. We love having them in church, and we love teaching them about all of the great things of the Scripture, just like we did this morning. Um, I'm Pastor Steve Klaus, the lead pastor here at Liberty United Methodist Church. Very excited to be with you this Palm Sunday. I have an important announcement to make this morning. Uh, how many of you were here last week and you were able to hear our guest worship leader, Chris Eights? A few hands raised? Great. Well, I want to let you know that as of April 23rd, Chris will become our regular worship leader. We've hired Chris. Chris is going to come and join our church. He's moving here from Louisiana, and uh, he's going to become our regular full-time worship leader here at Liberty United Methodist Church. Isn't that great? Yeah. So much energy he brings to the room and uh, a lot of guitars, lots and lots of guitars. Now, uh, in all seriousness, um, Chris has a family, has an eight-year-old son and a 13-year-old son and a wife uh, who works there in Louisiana, and he's going to come here for a few months and uh, let them finish out the school year before their entire family moves here. And so in all seriousness, we are looking for some sort of a family who might have perhaps a guest house or a, a non-weird, creepy basement room uh, that, that they might house Chris in temporarily while he works with us. And uh, so if you know of anyone who has the ability to offer those kinds of accommodations, please let us know because that would be great. We really want to offer as much hospitality as we can to Chris. Uh, I, no guarantees how many guitars end up in your place of residence based on uh, that offer. But anyway, we wanted to share that with you, and uh, we're so very glad and excited. I'm glad and excited to be here with you today. We're going to talk about the story of Zacchaeus. That's a part of our discernment process and a part of our Lenten study that we've been working on, uh, the story of Zacchaeus. Now, um, when I was a much, much younger man, much younger, like three years ago, let's say, I, I would have gotten up here and I might have said something about that, that I'm not short. I'm not. I know Zacchaeus is a story about a short guy. I'm not short. I would have, in my deep insecurity, uh, looked all over the internet to verify that the average American male is approximately five foot nine, but I'm no longer five foot nine. There's some things that have compressed due to the weight of me and the gravity of me, not the gravitas, but the gravity. And so, I'm short, and I'm just going to own it, and uh, we're going to learn today about the most famous short guy in the Bible, and I'd like to invite you to join me on that journey as we read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was so short, he could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, and when Jesus reached the spot where Zacchaeus was, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Now, it may seem strange that we would be reading this story, the story of Zacchaeus, uh, on the day that we celebrate the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, but this is another parade story in the New Testament. And probably, if this parade had not taken place in Jericho, which is not too far away from Jerusalem, there would have been a little bit less of a crowd on the day that Jesus processed into Jerusalem for Palm Sunday. 
This story of Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus is one of the most beloved and well-known children's stories in the New Testament. The encounter has been a children's favorite forever. Now, I learned this story through the medium of flannel graph. Flannel graph, which is kind of the equivalent of smoke signals used to, to let people know several towns away. Technologically, it's on that level. When I was a boy, there was a lady that would do Bible clubs in our neighborhood. Her name was Verna Stauffer, and she would get us into her room, and uh, she would share the story of Zacchaeus or one of the other stories from the Bible, and she would take scenic characters like this and put them up on a board with felt where they would magically stick, and then she would narrate her way through the story and tell us all about it. Now, if you were really, really a good boy and you were there for that Bible story, then you would receive a, a special piece of candy. The kid that was the quietest would get a little special piece of candy, the good candy. Now, at Mrs. Stauffer's, everybody got a piece of candy, but you were either going to be the quietest and the best behaved and get the good candy, or you were going to be not so well behaved, and you would receive something from the bowl that contained hard ribbon candy that uh, probably had been in that same bowl since the 1950s. And so I, I want you to pretend along with me that that we're all here and, and we're in this story of Zacchaeus and we're going to learn it uh, from something like flannel graph. It has all the elements of a classic children's story. There is a parade into a big town. There's an appearance from Jesus. There's a small man that children can relate to. There's a tree that gets climbed. There's a dinner in Zacchaeus' home. And then ultimately, the main character gives away his money. So in summary, here's what happens in this story. A man seeks an audience with a famous preacher. Be amazed and awed. I was when I was seven. And then he is asked to get down from the tree by Jesus. And then he says, Jesus, won't you come to my house today? And then, oh, I got them out of order. Where is that other one? Here we go. Oh, he hears people whispering behind his back. Jesus is going to the house of this super sinful guy. And so he makes this statement in front of Jesus. He says, here and now, I give all of the things that I, I give half of everything that I own. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'll pay it back four times. Now, friends, truthfully, the story of Zacchaeus has a lot to teach us as adults about ambition and about transformation and about the kingdom of God. The central feature in the first act of the story is Zacchaeus climbing up this sycamore tree so that he can catch a glimpse of Jesus. And as a narrator, Luke explains that Zacchaeus did this because he was short, he can't sight, catch sight of Jesus, and there was a crowded throng that lined the streets of Jericho. The reason that there was a throng there, the reason there was a parade going into town is that people heard that Jesus was coming into Jericho, and just outside of town, Jesus had stopped, and a blind man was calling to him. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he was healed on the spot by Jesus. And all of the people of the town ushered Jesus into Jericho, the same city where Joshua had caused all the walls to fall down and then been rebuilt. And now everyone parades into this town. And Zacchaeus is so short and so not well thought of if I can use a double negative there, that he has to climb a tree so he can find out what's going on. Now, the author of our Lenten study that we've been working on asked this important question about Zacchaeus. What was Zacchaeus hoping for when he climbed up that tree? Now, I might be diving into a little pop psychoanalysis here, but it's possible that Zacchaeus didn't just want to catch a glimpse of Jesus. It's possible that he also wanted to be seen by Jesus. Luke certainly goes out of his way to suggest that Zacchaeus was wealthy and well-known before he describes this parade into town. Maybe Zacchaeus wanted to meet Jesus 
to show himself to be worthy among all of his peers there in Jericho, or maybe to seek the approval of this famous teacher so that he too could have all of the the joys of what it means to be a celebrity, especially even a celebrity, especially even a celebrity preacher, if that's a thing. Now, whatever the motivation that Zacchaeus has, he is certainly, as we used to say in Elkhart, Indiana, he is jonesing for a chance to meet with Jesus. He's longing for it. A therapist might say Zacchaeus was attempting to meet one of several powerful drives in his life when he tried to get Jesus' attention. There's a psychiatrist named William Glasser who has a theory that most of us are attempting to fill our need for either survival or love or power or freedom or fun when we make important behavioral choices. It's possible Zacchaeus was hoping for one of those things. He wanted to either become more accepted or loved through his relationship with Jesus. He certainly had chosen a very unpopular profession as a tax collector. Maybe Jesus wanted to uh, be met by Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus wanted to meet Jesus to increase his power in town or his freedom of choice as a member of the elite in Jericho. Whatever his motivation was for climbing this tree and trying to get Jesus' attention, our Lenten study author, Magre de Vega, shares that the grace of God used this strange occasion to reach out and get a hold of Zacchaeus. John Wesley said that there is an element of God's grace that is always reaching out to us, that God's grace is forever looking for avenues to allow us to enter into life with Jesus and to be completely changed. And there are two really big ironies in this story of Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, of course, is hoping to catch a glimpse of Jesus, but he's ultimately the one who gets seen and understood And Jesus was not intending to stay in Jericho. He was actually just on his way to Jerusalem. This is the year before he made the big parade on his way to Jerusalem. And before Palm Sunday, we have this event where there's a big parade going into Jericho. Jesus was just passing through on his way to another festival. But because of this grace of God that was reaching out, Jesus ended up staying and staying with Zacchaeus. And after he came down from the tree, Zacchaeus and Jesus began to walk to his home together, and someone in the crowd kind of hissed behind their back that Jesus had gone to stay in the home of a sinner. And he hears this this terrible thing, and he immediately offers penance for his greedy crimes. He says, I will give half of my possessions to the poor. I will pay back four dollars for every one tax dollar that I overcharged. And the grace of God invaded the life of this little man known as Zacchaeus and changed him in powerful ways. And from that day on, he had a fresh start in life. Now, I want to pause here and do something that all of my seminary professors told me not to do. Don't, don't get too worried. It's, it's nothing heretical. But I was told we shouldn't use the Bible as an allegory, but I think that This particular story works really well as an allegory. It's something we can apply to our lives. And like Zacchaeus, many of you may have found yourself in a metaphorical tree hanging from a branch from time to time. Although maybe we believe that we climbed up this tree for some noble and worthy reason to get a new perspective on life or whatever, You may climb up the tree of life and find that the view that you get when you receive that and you get there is not so great. We might discover that we've climbed this tree only to realize that our motives are closer to Glasser's hierarchy of choices. We climbed thinking we had noble ideas, but we were there for survival or love or power or freedom. Sometimes the challenges of life will reveal these motivational choices to us, and it can be deflating when it does. If you're here and you're a parent, and that's a lot of you, I know, have you had the experience where you said to yourself, I'm not going to try and live vicariously through my children like I thought my parents did, and then signed them up for a sport only to realize that you're putting way too much energy and effort into it, and you're living vicariously through your kids? No, I have, I have, I, I've, 
pushed a little too hard on some things, and it looked like a great limb when I climbed out on it, but it wasn't so great when I got there. The key pursuit of Zacchaeus' life was money and the love of it. Zacchaeus had been taking advantage of his fellow man for profit for a long time. And when his sins were called out in front of this crowd of people, in the presence of Jesus, he immediately came to grips with the absolute futility of his wealth. There is nothing he can do in that moment to protect his reputation or to restore it or to make things better. He's stuck. He immediately recognized that all of his wealth, all of his money was impotent. It could not buy him a healthy relationship with the people of Jericho, and it couldn't fix his relationship with God. I read an article by an author named Stephen King. I think probably most of you know him. Stephen King talks about the futility of pursuing and hoarding in wealth, and, and Stephen King would know something about that, not so much that he was a hoarder, but he sold millions and millions of books and perhaps a few billion dollars worth of movie, uh, movie scripts have been turned into scripts from his stories. He had all of his needs and his wants met. And a few years ago, he was in a terrible accident where he was struck by a van while walking on the side of the road near his home. He was so badly injured, the doctors contemplated amputating his legs because of the severity of the problem. And this is what Mr. King had to say about his experience. He says, I found out what you can't take it with you means. I found this out while I was lying in a ditch on the side of a country road covered with mud and blood. I had a master card in my wallet, but no one was there to charge it. We all know that life is ephemeral, but I was on the receiving end of a painful but extremely valuable look at life's simple backstage truths. Mr. King goes on to say, we come into the world naked and broke, and even though we may be dressed up when we go out, we're still just as broke. Mr. King says, Warren Buffett is going to leave this world broke. Bill Gates is going out broke. Tom Hanks is going to be broke. Stephen King, broke. Not a crying dime to his name. All the money you earn, all the stocks you buy, all the mutual funds you trade, all of that is smoke and mirrors. So Mr. King said, if you want to consider making your life worthy, make it one long gift to other people. And why not? Everything that we have is on loan anyway. The only thing that lasts is what you pass on to other people. Clearly, Stephen King discovered the impotence of possessions and their inability to bring satisfaction, but what about us? Maybe your challenge isn't related to finances. Perhaps you spend time chasing after the love of others. For some people, they're looking for power or for freedom. Whatever you choose to chase in this world to fill up your soul, whatever takes you out onto that branch, it is not going to satisfy if Jesus is not at the center of it. So let me ask this important question. What tree have you climbed for survival or for love or power or freedom? Have you finally gotten tired of the race for survival and self-sufficiency? Jesus invites you to come down and to meet with him so the real work of transformation can begin. Jesus is asking you to come down so that you can be lifted up. I'm starting to understand that the only real satisfaction in this life is found in knowing Jesus. The Apostle Paul expressed it this way in a letter to the Philippians. He said that his former pursuits of his life as a religious zealot were worthless to him. And then he said, I gave up all the inferior stuff so that I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, going all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. What Paul is speaking about here is the act of surrender. There's a story that's told by a man named Paul Stanley. He was a military commander in the 60s in the Vietnam War. He says that it was not uncommon when uh, there was an action that took place that there would be a few people that would surrender themselves, or at least they would be taken prisoner if they didn't surrender. 
And one day, Commander Stanley says that he came upon a scene where all of his soldiers were standing in a circle around a young man. The young man had been shot in the lower leg, and he was screaming and yelling, throwing mud and doing everything he could to kick with his one good leg so that no one could actually take this man hostage. And one of the commander's men came to him and said, sir, what do we do? He's losing blood fast. He's not going to make it unless we do something. And so Commander Stanley made sure that he was able to make eye contact with this young boy. And in looking closer, he realized that the, Vietnam's, the Vietnamese soldier was only about 16 years old. He slowly took off his web belt, gave up all his weapons. He took off his cap. He walked very slowly around to the side of this young soldier, scooped him up in his arms, and he picked him up, and he walked him towards the medevac helicopter. And as he did so, he said, I realized I felt all of the tension leave the body of this little, little boy that I was cradling. He had gone from throwing mud and hurling whatever insults he could to relaxing letting go of all the tension. And then he softly started to sob as he put his head on my chest. That's what it's like when we surrender to God, friends. It may not be overtly there in the story of Zacchaeus, but so many of us are, are fighting. At first, we see God as an enemy, and we fight to claim our territory and our right to, to rule our own lives. But in our woundedness, we finally see that we cannot conquer God. And the God who we surrender to is not our enemy. He bids us to come down from our tree so that he can care for us and heal us, even as he takes us captive to his grace. So my friends, my invitation for you today is to come down from your tree, to put your trust in the one whom you've struggled with and against for many years, and to surrender because it is in that moment of surrender that you may finally know the power of the risen Christ and you may find a life that is so much more than you imagine. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that in this moment that we've set aside to pray, to reflect on this sermon, to honor you with everything that we are and have that you will call to us. God, I pray that you'll give us a mental picture of whatever branch we're out there in whatever tree alone suffering. And I pray that you will show us the way that we can get down so that we can be lifted up by Jesus. We can meet Jesus face to face. He can come to our house today and begin the work of transformation in our lives. Amen. Amen. Good morning, I'm Pastor Jared. I'm one of the associates here at our church. And as we continue in worship, we come to the time of our offering. And usually at this moment, we like to tell you about a specific ministry that your gifts support. I want to tell you that this past month has been mission, March Mission Madness, where our missions team has tried to create a number of opportunities for new volunteers to connect uh, with all the many different local ministries that we serve. And we had 38 new volunteers sign up across seven of our local ministries. We were ecstatic about that. Good job. Well done, everyone, church. We'd like to focus in more specifically on the work that we did this past Saturday at the Synergy Women's Domestic Violence Shelter. There were 18 of our people from church that showed up to help, and we did a number of different things for them. We created uh, therapy bags for them to use in their counseling sessions. We organized and assembled Easter baskets that were made up of an assortment of different toys and gifts and personal care items and candy for the children and for the teenagers and for the women that reside there. One of our young volunteers shared with us a special connection moment for them that she was given the name of a nine-year-old girl and she was able to go and find uh, something that she thought that she would like because she was also a nine-year-old girl. We also stuffed 600 eggs for their shelter for their upcoming scavenger hunt. And while each of these things may kind of seem small, um, 
the impact that they have on hurting families that may not have someone else looking after or loving on them is huge. Thank you for your involvement and support of Synergy of all of the different local missions that we do to try to bring God's kingdom here and now. And as the ushers come forth, may you remember them and be generous with your giving. If you're new to our community or it's been a while, feel free to drop your connection card in the plate as it goes by. And uh, you also have the opportunity in this space or online to give online. We take a moment and pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for being the light of the world that can be dark at times. Thank you for being a solid ground to stand on in times that may seem uncertain or shaky. Thank you for shining upon the way for the lost. Thank you for seeking out those that are missing or truant. Thank you for remembering those who feel neglected or forgotten. And in our thanksgiving, use us and bless the offering that we bring to make tomorrow an even better day than today. At this time, I'd like to invite you, each of you, to join us as a part of communion. We begin communion by saying the words of confession and pardon, which should be on the screen behind me. Would you join me in saying these words together? Merciful God, we've confessed that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be your obedient church. We've not done your will. We've broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for each of us while we were still sinners, and this proves God's love for us. So in the name of Jesus the Christ, I say that you are all forgiven. The Lord calls us to this communion table together. And so at this time, I want to invite Pastor Jared to come and join me. And we will invite each of you forward, those of you who'd like to receive communion. I'll be at this row right here, and Pastor Jared will be over there. And uh, as our ushers come and, and let you know, or you can just come and receive these communion elements. Won't you come and receive the bread and the wine together with us, please. The body and blood of Christ. The body and blood of Christ for you. The body and blood of Christ for you. The body and blood of Christ for you. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you hear before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what Rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled.
trampled on the ground You took the fall You thought of me Up above all Above all kingdoms Above all thrones Above all wonders The world is ever known Above all wealth And treasures of the earth There's no way to measure what you Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Amen. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to God, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat this meal, do it in remembrance of me. And on the same night, he offered them the cup when the meal was over, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you eat this meal and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Let's take our communion elements together right now. Would you pray one more time? Gracious God, we give thanks for your life in Christ that we know never ends. We give thanks for the connection that we have to the earliest of your disciples who shared this meal. And we pray for this to be a part of the transforming work of your grace in us, just as it was for James and John and Peter and Zacchaeus. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and let's finish this song together. Aaron, would you lead us, please? Crucified and lay behind the stone you live to die rejected
man, if you would stay standing, we're going to sing the stand together. You stood before creation Eternity in your hand You spoke the earth into motion My soul understand You stood before my face church, as we prepare to go forth from this place, there are a couple of connection points of announcements I'd like to share with you presently. And the first is a really big one because it is happening here and is happening this afternoon, and that is our Easter carnival. So kids and families, all ages are invited to come this afternoon back here to our campus from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. 
There's going to be an egg hunt. There is going to be a bounce house. There's going to be a petting zoo. There is going to be the Kahona Ice Truck. It's going to be epic, and we hope that you return. Um, bring your young people. Find more young people and bring them if you know them so that it's all good and not weird. Uh, but make sure that you don't miss it either way. That's happening this afternoon. This is Palm Sunday, and we have the rest of Holy Week ahead of us. We'd also like to invite you back to this place on Monday, Thursday, this coming Thursday, where we will together as a community, um, like the Last Supper, celebrate the, the elements, the communion, and the community in our midst in this place at 7 o'clock. We hope that you will join us there. But that is not all, because the more the story continues, there is also Good Friday, and there is going to be a special choral cantata happening over at the Sunset Campus at 7 o'clock this coming Friday. Don't miss that. As the whole story comes together, we will gather again in this place next week for Easter. We hope that you come, that you invite someone to come with you. And if you're a regular member of our church, I'd also ask maybe that you park a little farther away to leave room for all the visitors that are going to be coming this next week. Thank you, Jared. As lead pastor and after last week's pants discussion during our final announcements, I feel uh, the need to clarify. Please bring people that you are legally authorized to bring to, to our children's event, right? Yes, That's absolutely. what you meant, right? I, Good. If that's not what I said, that is what I meant. Excellent. And just for the record, everyone in our office wears pants when they're in our office, everyone. It's been so great to be with you folks. We've had a wonderful time. Uh, I've loved in, in celebrating our, our hosannas today. And um, because I care for you all so much, and because I'm not bitter about not ever receiving the best candy from Mrs. Stauffer, I've made sure that everybody has access to a small piece of the good stuff, something with chocolate in it. It's in a bowl on your way out. They're all individually wrapped. You can take them because you've all been really, really good as we've listened to the story of Zacchaeus, <laughs> and I appreciate it. Let's have a prayer before we leave for today. God, I pray that you'd help us as we come down from the tree that we find ourselves in. May we find you, and may we be transformed by you forever. Amen. We are so glad you joined us for worship today. We hope through the word spoken or sung, you were able to feel a genuine connection with God. As we strive to show you the ways that God loves you and cares about you, we hope that you found truth and meaning in our service today. You can take part of the message and apply it to your life to discover how God is working through you in these days. We hope that we will see you again soon, either with us online next week or in person here at our Rush Creek campus. Please remember to be in touch and let us know if there is anything we can do for you as your church family. Go in peace and have a great week. We will see you next time.